Okay, so I'm uh, Leon Cochin, and I'll be uh, introducing our final two speakers. And as Maura said, we have two excellent speakers to close out this, this conference. So our next speaker is Dr. Stephen McGurk. Uh, Steve is the Vice President of Programs at the International Development Research Center, or IEDRC, in Ontario, Canada. And he'll tell us a little more about that uh, organization. He asked me to keep his introduction short, so I'll just touch on a few points. Received his PhD from Stanford at their Food Research Institute. He's an economist and an expert on China, and he has an impressive record of accomplishment in the field of rural development. So for more than 30 years, he has studied uh, Asia's rural development. Um, prior to his current job with the IDRC, he's held several other uh, high-profile jobs with them in various areas in China. He's also worked with the Ford Foundation in Beijing and with the World Bank. Uh, and also was taught at uh, my undergraduate alma mater, UC Berkeley. And so I uh, welcome him with the title of his talk, Megatrends Driving Agri-Food Research for the Development in Low and Middle Income Countries. Steve. Uh, it's a pleasure. Um, particularly a uh, pleasure to uh, have accepted uh, Maurice Maloney's uh, and Wilf Keller's uh, very kind uh, invitation to be a sponsor, uh, to have uh, some of the research that we've supported uh, actually featured here. Um, so, uh, Teresa Mosquera's uh, work on uh, yellow potatoes in Colombia, uh, Shalim Bayen's work uh, in southern Ethiopia on pulses, uh, and Manish Raizada's uh, work uh, on sustainable intensification kits uh, in Nepal uh, were all uh, uh, featured here in talks over the last two days, uh, and uh, we're delighted uh, that uh, uh, we were given an opportunity to do that. What I'm going to talk about uh, is, uh, however, uh, not particularly science-based, uh, a bit more policy-based. And so I hope uh, you will grant me a little indulgence, given that uh, we did come with uh, three uh, science-based uh, presentations uh, during uh, this conference. So the International Development Research Center is a Canadian crown corporation. Since we're being webcast, many people may not know. Uh, we were founded by two prime ministers, um, uh, Lester Pearson and uh, Pierre Trudeau, and Lester Pearson was the first uh, uh, board chair of IDRC. So that dates us uh, to 1970. Agriculture was where we began uh, working uh, and where we continue to work. Um, David Hopper was IDRC's first president. I suspect a number of you have known David uh, over the years. Uh, he just died uh, this year, uh, but had worked with Norman Borlaug uh, on the Green Revolution in India, where in fact he met Mike Pearson, uh, who was uh, traveling at Indira Gandhi's invitation to uh, try to understand uh, the famine in 1965 in India. And he met uh, 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 the future president of IDRC there working on the Green Revolution who persuaded the Prime Minister that science and technology had a contribution to play in addressing famine. And uh, when uh, Mike Pearson retired from the Canadian government, he ensured that this new organization, a one-of-a-kind, the International Development Research Centre, was established to in fact provide support to do precisely that from the international assistance envelope. Uh, our focus is on very applied, last mile uh, uh, research support, largely to institutions in the developing world, uh, also Canadian institutions and a few international institutions, but 85 plus percent of all of our research support goes directly to developing country institutions. Some of the CG institutes, you're represented here, get a little bit of uh, support from us, uh, Roots uh, uh, Tubers, 
uh, for example, uh, being an example of a CRP that uh, we have invested in, um, among others. About 10 years ago, we had focused very much on ongoing devolution, governmental devolution, in rural areas across the developing world. And that was raising a number of very real questions about how agricultural extension systems and agricultural research systems at the national level could survive. Uh, as most of the resources to support those institutions had melted away in these devolution uh, efforts. Um, because of the huge crunch in most of this infrastructure and institutions, increasingly communities themselves at a very local level had to take over some of these uh, uh, functions, uh, these extension functions, and even community-based research projects. Uh, and that's most of what we did was try to figure out with moribund uh, extension systems, what could we do? Uh, in those days, private extension systems were just embryonic in most of the poor uh, developing countries of the world. They're stronger now, but uh, they were extraordinarily uh, weak uh, then. However, one thing we noticed as we were helping agricultural research stations and extension systems try to get out of their institutions and into the field and see what communities were doing to find their own solutions was that there was a lot of low-hanging fruit that wasn't being picked up. There were lots of interesting findings in those ag research stations and in agricultural extension systems that was not getting out to communities. And the traditional method of pushing them out uh, had long since uh, lost any value or traction amongst the communities that might take advantage of them. So while we were trying to deal with this policy conundrum of the collapse of extension systems and the collapse of national agricultural research systems, we were increasingly aware that there's all this stuff, interesting little pieces of work on indigenous vegetables, on uh, um, new types of millet processing that's not being picked up. It's not getting out there. Our governors were particularly acute in saying, why don't you actually fund some innovation work? So that's what we approached the Canadian government with in 2008. And we said, we know you're skeptical about uh, research. We know that research takes a long time to actually get to the point where it gets out to communities. It's particularly the case in developing countries where most of the institutions that you could build upon typically are very weak, and particularly weak at the level in which you need them to be strong. The Canadian government said, no, there's, the research will take too long. The international assistance envelope has to show results in actual changes in people's livelihoods in three years. Can't be done. Can't be done. We said, give us five years. Consider it a 10-year program of innovation, and we'll do it in two five-year chunks. We persuaded them to give it a try. But they were deeply skeptical. And every time we had a joint conversation with the Canadian government, it was very much, hmm, why can't we get results next year uh, after 18 months uh, of uh, uh, on the field research work? So it was a real tension for us. Um, but we persevered. And that's work that I want to talk to you uh, about today. Um, so most of the my talk is framed by a discussion of big changes, some of which um, we uh, explored very much uh, through this program of innovation uh, over the last uh, eight years, and some of which uh, comes out of work that we've been supporting for much longer periods of time, looking at longer-term institutional and organizational change 
uh, affecting rural communities. I'm really not going to talk a lot about this. Um, most of this has been already better uh, brought out uh, by others. But I did want to add this little piece, which has not come out well, and it's quite important for rural areas. And I have to catch up on my little pad here, so, okay. So the, the dramatic change uh, across the developing world, uh, and increasingly in sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia, um, is towards um, uh, a much uh, um, broader uh, pattern of urbanization than is commonly understood. So currently about half of the world's urban population resides in towns and small and medium-sized cities up to about half a million people. So that's 27% of the world's population lives in small towns uh, or medium-sized cities. And these are the cities that are the most connected to rural areas. These are, in fact, potential engines of change for rural areas. These are the areas where rural people migrate to. These are the areas that provide peripheral health services uh, to rural people. Uh, these are the areas um, uh, that rural people leaving uh, for service jobs and for government jobs uh, will look first. And increasingly, it's difficult to talk about rural areas as being disconnected uh, and isolate because so many of the rural areas are now deeply connected uh, to urban areas, both in terms of very real physical connections to small and medium-sized cities, but also through migration to even farther away cities. So there's a number of important implications, and this came out of uh, a, a series of work that we commissioned uh, around the world on uh, rural inclusion um, done by Julio Berdegue uh, of the RIMISP uh, network, um, in case anyone's interested. So first, uh, rural areas are diversifying uh, as are rural household and community livelihood strategies. Agricultural structural transformation is underway almost everywhere. And that means agriculture is increasingly less important to national economies relative to services and in some places, mostly Asia, manufacturers. The growing integration of different kinds of contemporary agriculture with manufacturing and services and value chains strongly influenced, if not dominated, by intermediate and downstream actors with an urban base is now fundamentally a feature of the rural world all over the world. And that's been assisted um, by very large improvements in connectivity in rural areas, both physical connectivity and phone connectivity. And of course, through migration, um, it, which has persisted, uh, which has very real uh, drivers and consequences, both for rural and urban development. And of course, also, as I mentioned, by the greater importance of subnational governments as um, uh, globally uh, decentralization policies uh, have become uh, quite central. So the diversification of rural economies and rural households, in turn, has resulted in off-farm incomes being increasingly dominant. Not farm incomes, off-farm incomes are now dominant to rural households. These are very broad numbers, I appreciate, and Sub-Saharan Africa is not quite there uh, relative to uh, Asia and Latin America, but uh, this is changing very fast. And uh, um, so there, there are multiple uh, income strategies that households have adopted in this very diverse world forward and backward linkages to agricultural production, responding to urban demand, 
other rural industries, uh, mining, oil and gas, etc., and other rural-based activities, tourism. Uh, the Minister of uh, Canada's uh, International Development and La Francophonie, uh, Marie-Claude Bibot, uh, before she came back into government, uh, she ran a tourism industry in Sherbrooke, uh, where my mother is from. And uh, if you don't know uh, L'Estrie, uh, southeastern Quebec, uh, it used to be farmland. Uh, nowadays, uh, northern New England and southeastern Quebec, you, you are hard pressed to find a lot of farmland. It's mostly leisure activities nowadays. Unlike Saskatchewan. So, where am I? Two different machines at the same time. It's probably too much for me to handle. So you have my apologies. I will sort it out. So those rising incomes uh, have led uh, uh, to uh, a range of changes which a number of speakers uh, have spoken to today uh, as well as yesterday. Um, interestingly, uh, the double burden is increasingly uh, a prominent. Uh, mortality rates in developing countries now uh, no longer feature uh, communicable disease in the top 10 factors uh, for mortality. Uh, in the top 10, it's largely traffic accidents and chronic disease. Uh, it, it looks like North America. Cancers, respiratory illness, hypertension, these are uh, um, these double burdens. Okay, I'm gonna skip the next one. Or am I? Yes, I am. So another major trend uh, has been diversification of smallholder farming systems, which follows on uh, very naturally from the previous discussion. No surprise, uh, a number of uh, researchers, particularly uh, in the UK and the US, are questioning the narrow focus on small-scale agriculture for growth uh, in favor of other models such as large-scale commercial producers and mixed uh, small and large-scale um, uh, models. Uh, we, however, continue to believe that a small scale uh, focus on a, a focus on small scale farmers is very important um, and that technologies that can uh, provide for more efficient and more commercial uh, small scale farming um, uh, are, are going to be very important. I don't think I'm going to talk much to this. It's just to give you a sense of the kinds of um, uh, details uh, of changes that are underway and the, the types of uh, 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 motivations and constraints uh, facing uh, smallholders uh, in this transition towards more commercial uh, smallholding. And as I said, um, these kinds of uh, diversification patterns uh, are very suggestive of the kinds of immediate applications uh, that will be of value uh, to diversifying smallholders. Uh, so clearly, uh, uh, things that uh, allow uh, households to take a portfolio uh, approach um, uh, to their incomes, uh, including remittances uh, from cities, um, and from uh, uh, work in other countries. Uh, this results in a greater propensity for more specialized approaches to agriculture. Agriculture, again, is not the only source of income. And uh, diversity has a much greater value, uh, a greater value than having a larger farm in many cases. Um, and so the role of mechanization, particularly tools and machines that are appropriate for women to use, becomes increasingly important for increasing productivity of small farms. 
Uh, so just a few examples here, a corn sheller, uh, planting uh, uh, tools, uh, uh, dehuller for small millets, and uh, uh, cell phone uh, uh, weather uh, uh, app. Um, here's another example. Here's slightly uh, larger uh, smallholder commercialization. Um, this is an effort uh, that came to us uh, from a group uh, uh, at the uh, University of Agriculture in uh, Tamil Nadu uh, in southern India, uh, and the industry associate, the Mango Industry Association of Sri Lanka, uh, who wanted to work with Guelph University, who'd been working on cherries and soft fruit um, uh, preservation. Uh, so here, mangoes, uh, you probably don't know, but it's very difficult to get Alfonso's in Delhi nowadays. Um, my favorite uh, mangoes are available really only for about a two-week window, and uh, they're very expensive uh, to get. Uh, so I basically have to load up the back of my car with crate after crate, and of course I have to give most of them away because they rot uh, very fast. Um, and those are only the ones that actually made it uh, to Delhi. So huge amount of losses. Uh, and here are losses that are not economic losses. They're not uh, uh, fed to other animals. They're not uh, uh, used in any other processing. They're dead weight loss. Um, so. Uh, here was an example where we adapted uh, hexanol, uh, that smell, for me, the smell I get when I mow grass, that's hexanol. Uh, adapting hexanol to uh, spraying on soft fruits uh, has proven uh, fairly dramatically uh, uh, effective in uh, lengthening the time uh, to ripening of uh, soft fruits. So a final element in the diversification of smallholder farming has been a fairly dramatic uh, technological chain, change in logistics and supply management systems. Um, for example, um, and I was, uh, before I came back to Canada and uh, at the end of 2012, I spent seven years in India, so I have a lot of examples from India, so you'll excuse me. Uh, between uh, 2004 and uh, 2013, uh, India's modern food sector uh, grew 45% a year, every year for a decade. Now, granted from a very low level, but that kind of transformative growth, 45% a year growth every year for a decade, um, uh, has been a driver of uh, absolute change in rural areas. Uh, there's also been a growth of processing uh, agribusiness, both in modern and in traditional retail, uh, centralized procurement uh, for supermarkets uh, that are increasingly uh, evident across uh, cities uh, in the developing world. And of course, related to that, integrated packing, grading, processing, transport, and logistics, including warehousing, warehousing finance, uh, cold chains, and even commodity exchanges. So in 2012, the government of Ethiopia set up the first commodity exchange in Africa. Um, so for smallholders, what are the implication? They need to be prepared to raise the standards on the farms to meet the needs of these increasingly integrated uh, food chains. So I'm not going to say much about this. We've heard, again, um, uh, much more about this. Just give you a couple of examples of work, again, that we financed through this uh, innovation uh, program. So here in the Sahel, um, basically, uh, these are microdosing of uh, fertilizer compared with uh, water, uh, coupled with water harvesting programs. This has proved uh, extraordinarily effective, and uh, it's now been coupled with uh, efforts uh, in Nigeria uh, to grow indigenous vegetables and reintroduce uh, the marketing of indigenous vegetables into Nigerian cities combined with uh, microdosing of fertilizers and uh, water harvesting. Um, 
So in this case, clearly uh, less energy use, uh, also very cheap uh, input use. Uh, so that for very poor farmers uh, and very small-scale farmers, um, uh, this is uh, doable. Here's another example um, of work uh, that Shalim and others uh, talked about at this meeting. I'm not going to talk more about it. And yet another example. How do I go back? There we go. Um, that uh, Manish uh, Rezaida spoke to uh, yesterday. So again, I'm not going to speak to any of those, and I'm almost done. So here was the skepticism that we faced uh, from the Canadian government uh, when, we, when we began this uh, innovations program. Um, we've heard uh, incredible ideas and um, uh, absolutely transformative uh, technological uh, visions, um, but we've also heard of this skepticism over the complex, very process-oriented and anecdotal nature of most development research. That is not uh, the agricultural research so much, but the development research, and concerns very much that research takes too long to show results, as I said, um, a failure to benefit many people, particularly poor people from research, and research projects that remain islands of success uh, within their local context. So why do we then need attention to research? I'm clearly preaching to the choir, but I would say from the development perspective that there's major gaps in understanding uh, how we get new technologies tools and innovations into the hands of poor uh, smallholders and pastoralists. We need more innovations and technologies, particularly uh, those that uh, are not uh, around the major export crops of uh, uh, wheat, uh, um, uh, rice, uh, and, uh, and maize, um, uh, where there exists. Um, uh, some uh, um, national agricultural research capacity, and there remains, uh, and in some cases are now new uh, private uh, extension uh, systems that uh, uh, can work alongside the, uh, the national systems that uh, are still been able to maintain themselves. Um, I don't think I'm going to say much more about um, the skepticism, except to say that um, the real problem here is uh, taking uh, these small-scale innovations uh, with poor farmers to some level of scale. And um, I have to say that uh, we deliberately targeted a certain kind of scale. Uh, we took a look at most of the major um, uh, international um, foundation and bilateral support uh, to scale efforts, the Feed the Futures of USAID, the Grand Challenges of Gates. And um, when they were taking things to scale, uh, it was largely with multinational corporations. So the Del Montes, the PepsiCo's, uh, uh, for northern Ethiopia uh, to expand chickpea production for export to the Middle East. Um, uh, very helpful, uh, very useful, but we felt it had one major deficiency, and that was it didn't really build up the private sector uh, in those national settings. And without the private sector as a key partner uh, to public sector efforts in many of these developing countries, um, they're going to be uh, in trouble, and in trouble for a long time to come. And simply bringing in the PepsiCo's of the world uh, wasn't going to help address that very much. It might a little bit, but um, we had another example, which I don't have in front of me, um, which I will talk about very quickly. So uh, Danon uh, runs most of the yogurt business in uh, South Africa and in uh, urban East Africa. 
And they do it uh, with very large industrial processing of yogurt uh, in urban uh, uh, large-scale industrial plants. Uh, there are no ties uh, to uh, rural farm chains. There are no stimulus whatsoever uh, to milk producers uh, in these countries. There is a complete disconnect. So despite yogurt industries going to scale in South Africa and parts of urban East Africa, in fact, they haven't uh, dramatically uh, changed the nature of uh, processing of milk products. So this particular example was another one that we struggled with. This one is uh, reducing livestock uh, losses in, in Africa through the development of multivalent, uh, cheap and temperature stable uh, vaccines. Um, so a couple of individuals well known to this community uh, here in Saskatoon came to see us and said, we've got a crazy idea. Uh, you're, we know you're going to throw us out, but you need to listen. And they said, we can reduce the search for critical proteins in livestock vaccine discovery research from 12 years to 18 months. And with that, we can take a five-year development project and develop a new vaccine from scratch for livestock. We threw them out. Go home. Cannot, cannot be done. It's, it's good work, but we just don't believe you can do it in the life of a development project. Five years. Cannot be done. We put it out to scientific review. The reviewers agreed. A great idea cannot be done with development assistance. Go find other research money for this. These Saskatoon-based researchers came back to us and said, you're wrong. We can do it. Give us one more chance. So Lauren Hepworth, Stan Blade, a few others, individuals in this room who are responsible for the decision said, take a chance. Do something that governments don't do. Take a risk. Take a bet. So we did. Well, they didn't do it in five years. They did it in six, but they did it. They developed a five-in-one multivalent uh, vaccine, one shot, temperature stable, doesn't need refrigeration, doesn't need a cold chain, uh, from scratch for lumpy skin disease, sheep and goat pox, um, peste de menin, uh, and I've forgotten what the other two are, lung plague and can't even remember. Um, so to us, that was incredibly impressive. Um, this revelation that something really quite fundamental has changed in how long it takes to do translational research. Uh, and what has changed? In this particular case, bioinformatics. They were able to simulate the surface of macromolecules using computer simulations in 18 months, what normally would have taken uh, uh, close to 15 years uh, in searching for proteins. We had not been aware of that dramatic increase in simulation capacity, uh, that bioinformatics was a really key uh, element. And that leads me uh, to almost one of my last slides, and that's, um, got to find it. Um, big and open data. Um, you probably don't know, but in separate work we've done uh, over the last 30 years, we've helped to build up open universities, uh, adult education systems that tried to build technical education skills. And increasingly, over the last decade, those have been skills in information technologies and communication technologies. And this field has dramatically taken off. How many times did we hear over the last two days about computational uh, biology, about uh, massive new data sets, uh, about um, the ability uh, to combine uh, enormous uh, amounts of data in completely novel ways? So let me just give you a couple of examples. We've actually funded research that looked at airtime credit purchases as a proxy for food spending 
in market-dependent households in East Africa. Uh, we've looked at, at uh, uh, work on the Climate Corporation, which is an open data business that offers uh, more accurate insurance and commercial advisory service to help farmers manage and adapt to climate change. So predictive models that fail to give uh, uh, much information about local conditions because they couldn't really be downscaled very effectively, um, leading to very inefficient uh, risk calculations. Uh, climate corporations and open data business that offers more accurate insurance and a commercial advisory service. I think many of you farmers here in rain-fed uh, Western uh, Canada and the U.S. know this uh, very well. Uh, I was in Des Moines last year uh, considering could we do more of this kind of work in East Africa and uh, I was approached by two private uh, sector uh, American businessmen who uh, wanted to work with us to do this in East Africa. Uh, another example, climate smart decision making tool for Colombian rice growers uh, helped uh, farmers avoid uh, damage from drought. Um, so. Uh, a real uh, a strong uh, possibility. Canada is a leader. Uh, you may not know it. Um, Canada is a member of the Open Government Partnership and Canada in that uh, Open Government Partnership which Obama created with his first executive act when he became president. Canada is responsible for the open data work globally in the Open Government Partnership. Um, and because I'm on camera, I get to say that IDRC uh, is the lead uh, for Canada on open data. So clearly we believe uh, that uh, open data enables the kind of uh, a big data use uh, that can be extraordinarily powerful. Can anyone tell me how many open databases Canada has, the government of Canada has? I can tell you we have more than twice as many as the United States, open databases. Canada has currently over 200,000 open databases of government data, of the government of Canada. I'm sorry. What can I say? Um, so let me end uh, with uh, pointing out the obvious, which uh, all of you know. Uh, clearly, um, uh, Canada has an extraordinary advantage in having now built up a genomics platform uh, across Canada. Uh, we've been able to demonstrate in the last uh, six years uh, that uh, far from being uh, basic and foundational research, uh, this genomics platform in Canada can be combined uh, with research in developing countries uh, to produce scalable uh, uh, transformations uh, on the ground uh, so we're going to uh, actual um, uh, regulatory uh, dossiers uh, on the livestock vaccine. Uh, three in one for uh, South Africa, five in one uh, for Kenya, and uh, I believe it'll be a four in one uh, for Tanzania. The, you heard from Teresa about the better uh, uh, yellow potato uh, varieties, uh, they're already at scale. Over 500,000 uh, Colombian farmers have adapted the yellow potatoes. Uh, clearly, um, there's a whole range of work that can be done uh, both on uh, genomics, uh, on uh, big data, uh, and uh, we believe on uh, last mile uh, technological applications. Um, we are uh, very persuaded uh, that we need um, research that's excellent and innovative, of course, uh, that's use-inspired, uh, that's about on-the-ground solutions with farmers and along the value chain. And we actually think that there's likely to be more applications uh, for immediate improvements, not on-farm, but post-harvest, uh, particularly in midstream and downstream uh, parts of uh, food chains. Uh, we think that it's absolutely critical that the kinds of solutions uh, uh, look at uh, last mile, 
solutions for women and the poor um, to boost uh, nutrition and incomes. Um, so we've sponsored a whole range of work looking at the gendered implications of changes in livestock uh, markets, for example. Uh, we need to connect producers to markets. Uh, they're already uh, somewhat connected, but in ways that, that may not be uh, that helpful for them. Uh, and that may require them constantly to upgrade standards using resources they don't have. We need to make a difference at scale. The only way we will overcome skepticism about the value of research to actual changes in people's lives in poor developing countries in the time frame of government funded projects, not private funded ones, is if we can do this at scale. So simply doing a project in a village here, a project in a, in a village there isn't going to work. There's all kinds of machines down here. Boy, I could be turning on the cameras. Um, we also need to work with uh, private sectors in developing countries themselves. So not just the Danons, the PepsiCo's, the Frito-Lays, the Del Montes. We need to be working with small scale and medium scale uh, farm producers, farm processors, wholesalers, uh, wholesale finance uh, institutions, um, coal chain uh, operators, and so on. Um, finally, uh, these need to be sustainable uh, innovations and inclusive. Thank you very much. This is the set of uh, projects that I talk about around the world. from Nestle. I do have to challenge you on your description of multinationals with factories in urban areas with no contact to farmers. I and mean, this is certainly not the way that we operate. 80% of our factories, that's 400 factories, are in rural areas employing over 200,000 people and largely supplied by local raw materials. And we're buying directly from 800,000 smallholder farmers, delivering them training. And we've been doing this for years and years. Well so, done. So uh, if, you, if you look good at Good on you, and keep it up. OK. <laughs> we may just can mention that our milk districts, which we started 140 years ago, are now in 30 countries. So this is really continuous for the long term. And it's not only in dairy. We're in countries building up new supply chains in countries like South Sudan, we're starting to build up the coffee industry there. So. I, I don't think I suggested whatsoever that uh, uh, international uh, um, private uh, sector uh, investments aren't needed and valuable, and uh, I certainly think they are. Um, I was only making the point, and horribly it seems, uh, that um, I think there's a, a, a niche uh, for groups that uh, try to build uh, national uh, private sectors, particularly uh, ones that are uh, extremely dispersed uh, across uh, rural and urban areas. And I think that is a role uh, that's not been played uh, that much. Um, I do appreciate uh, um, your comments, and it's clear that, um, that some companies uh, are very active in this area. So thank you. So I have a question. I have a microphone. You can come up here. All right. Sharing your little microphone. So I was, uh, I was really surprised by the data early in your talk that the, the small farms, the small farmers in, in rural developing countries, more, more of their income comes from non-farms. Yeah. So, and, uh, and I know you're trying to address that, but what, what is the implication of that? Are you seeing uh, uh, kind of migration from those farms, leaving them behind, or maybe amalgamation of small farms into bigger farms? What's, are there trends related to that? Um, 
there's all kinds of implications uh, of it. Uh, it's clear that uh, households uh, have uh, very much a portfolio approach with some individuals in the household working in nearby towns, contributing part of their salary to the household, yet others uh, migrating uh, much farther afield and uh, uh, sending back resources uh, as they're able. Equally, some members of the household produce largely for the local uh, household care economy, as it were, right around the house so they can look after uh, the poultry and the children, and yet others work for market sales. Uh, in nearby towns, and yet others are integrated into much larger food chains that go to major metropolitan areas uh, through all kinds of uh, different kinds of uh, logistic uh, uh, um, cold chains and storage and uh, uh, transport systems. Are there any other questions? Don't even ask them. So uh, it's uh, with uh, great pleasure that I introduce our final speaker. She's a good friend and a longtime collaborator, um, Dr. Susan McCooch from the now section of plant breeding and genetics at Cornell University. Susan is the Barbara McClintock Professor of Plant Breeding and Genetics in our new School of Integrated Plant Sciences at Cornell. Uh, she received her PhD with Steve Tanksley and then she went on to Erie for five years to start her career-long commitment to international agriculture and, and rice agriculture particularly, and developing country agriculture, before coming back to Cornell to join the faculty. She's, we all know her very well. She's widely recognized as a world leader, a pioneer in uh, molecular mapping in rice and development of genomics-based platforms that are used to mine and, and, and take advantage of the uh, amazing plant diversity in rice and in other crop species. Um, in addition to her, you know, her, her really amazing publication record, she provides researchers around the world use her molecular markers, use the genotyping platform she puts out, the analysis protocols, and, and lots of rice germplasm resources to use both for research in the lab and for plant breeding in the field. Um, she also has a very strong commitment to teaching and mentoring, and she has uh, trained uh, scores of PhD uh, students and postdocs who are now out there making uh, their own contributions to internationally to agricultural research at universities, uh, international research organizations, and, and uh, industry. She's received a number of awards, just a couple of them, include the Cornell Chancellor's Award for Excellence in Scholarship and Creative Activities. She was elected Fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science, the AAAS, and she's also Chair of the AAAS Section on Agriculture and Natural Resources. She's also in great demand as, a, as an advisor, and for example, she's a, a scientific advisor to the Global Rice Science Partnership and also to the US NSF Advisory Committee for International Science and Engineering. So I'd like to uh, uh, join me in welcoming her to give her talk entitled Biodiversity and Food Security. Susan. Well, thank you. It's a pleasure to see a few of you remaining. Actually, it's a fairly full house to be uh, offered this very honorary position, I'm sure, of being the last speaker. You always uh, reach the end of the conference and just hope a few of you are still hanging on. So um, thanks to Maurice and to the, to the others who have invited me. My first trip to, Sk uh, to Saskatoon, hopefully not my last. Okay, so today I'm going to be talking about um, the use of genomic-assisted breeding, it, the way that it has trended and where we're going and what I think we can do with it in terms of managing natural variation. And I am a plant breeder by training, so I, my domain of, of activity will be talking about uh, the world of plant breeding as we think about managing natural variation, recombining it, deploying it, 
and also trying to understand it. Is there a, f I'm sorry, I don't know. Oh, just this, okay, got it. So of course, any breeder of staple foods has the, the suite of, grow, of the global grand challenges in the back of their mind, and I don't know, need to go over these in any, in any detail with you now. I just wanna say that if you work in rice, particularly, many people know that rice is probably the world's oldest monocrop. And when we think about monocropping, the standard concern is, my goodness, you, you work in a crop that's just uniform. And I wanna show you that it is absolutely not uniform. And in fact, that lack of uniformity and the diversity that is in, encompassed by the rice varieties and the way in which we deploy and use natural variation is probably our most significant way of mitigating the challenges of the unpredictability of the climate that we're all dealing with now. So we are aiming to increase rice production by about 50% by 2050. That is a very conservative estimate of what we need. I think this is a doable estimate. It translates to about 1.6% uh, genetic gain per year, per year. We're not at that now, so that represents a significant increase in the rate of genetic gain, but it is, I think, uh, achievable. And genetic variation for a breeder is the key to accomplishing that goal. Now in rice, most breeders focus on locally adapted elite germplasm, but that germplasm will cease to be adapted to the region of the world in which they work uh, as the climate changes. And I think that Sarah's presentation earlier about the fungi is, is similar to what we're facing with respect to the diversity that's adapted in different parts of the world on rice. Gene banks one of our great allies in the uh, quest to utilize and understand natural variation contain thousands, or if you will, globally millions of diverse strains of crops, but they're largely uncharacterized. Most are never used. The Erie Gene Bank, which contains over 200,000 different strains of wild and cultivated rice, estimates that approximately 2% of those have ever been actually deployed in breeding. So we have an opportunity um, we need a technology in order to make that opportunity really speak to the plant breeder. Utilizing more diverse germplasm resources requires time, money, and a good roadmap. And I just want to say that when you think about crossing parents, if you cross parents that are too similar, then you get no genetic gain because there isn't enough genetic variation on which to select. In rice, if you cross cultivated strains that are too dissimilar or too divergent genetically, you can end up with sterility. So if you cross a tempered japonica with an indica, your outcome is not favorable. So what we have to do is manage that diversity within a kind of window whereby we can either use our crossing technologies in a, in a, in a useful fashion, but we have to understand what we're working with. So I like to say that rice is a mosaic of diversity. As an inbred crop, most rice is actually inbreeding homozygous and therefore each strain is a, um, is a haplotype or is a, is, it is not like a hybrid, it is not, does not contain two different alleles at every locus. But nonetheless, it's a mosaic of diversity and I hope I will convince you over the course of this talk uh, to understand where I'm coming from on that. Before we go down that road, for those of you who don't work with rice, I just wanna remind you rice, like many of the crops we've been hearing about today, is produced on farms that even today, on average, farm size is less than a hectare of land. 92% of rice that is, that is produced on the planet is consumed within the country where it's produced. So it's really not a commodity in the sense that wheat or maize is. So of the three staple food crops, rice stands out because it is largely locally consumed. And the corollary of that is that the consumer preferences tend to be very local. People like their own rice. They don't like the rice that might come in from somebody else's country. So quality preferences, and as the population gains income, one of the things that, it is, that we've seen in the rice market is that higher quality rice is demanded, and higher quality rice, people are willing to pay for higher quality rice, but it's their higher quality rice. There is no universal or international standard on what makes rice 
particularly good for a given population. So I, I just say consumer quality preferences are diverse and inelastic. You will know that to be the case if you are from a rice growing country and you will know that to be the case if you have friends from rice growing countries. They like their own rice. So, oh dear, something's missing, oh well. Um, so I'm gonna be talking about the role that I've played in the rice community, which has been to some extent to live and work in Ithaca, New York means I do not have a large body of rice farmers at my door asking me to accomplish any kind of um, application in agriculture uh, for, for a local market. So I have stepped back and tried to take a much more global view of what, uh, of what we have. And since I'm not serving a local market, I'm not constrained by the local preferences. And I tend, therefore, to have a much broader um, look at things. So we, sought out, we set out to build a roadmap of natural variation and we asked three questions. How much genetic variation is there in Ariza sativa? How is it partitioned and where is it found? Can we use that diversity to identify genotype, phenotype associations for traits of interest? And you heard a little bit about that work um, from Sigrid Hoyer earlier in the, um, in the conference, some very excellent examples of genotype, phenotype uh, work, trying to clone genes and identify them. And how can we efficiently select on favorable alleles, not at one or two loci, but at thousands of loci across the genome simultaneously to increase the overall rate of genetic gain in rice improvement? So one approach, and you'll hear me talking about the, the focused approach where you're trying to find out what genes govern a particular trait, and that's one approach. And the other approach is how do we just manage the whole genome where we're working with multiple traits simultaneously in adaptation to an environment where we may not know or even care about the identity of the genes or the traits that confer that performance uh, quality that we're looking for. So to the answer the first question, how much genetic variation is there in Ariza sativa? Uh, we start by looking at the Erie gene bank and at the USDA gene bank. And we first put together, many years ago, a collection of land race and elite materials as well as wild species. And today we are, we've got a panel which has been purified. You'll hear more about it in a little while. Um, consisting of about 1,500 land races. These are purified genetic stocks. They exist as homoz homozygous strains. And they come from 80 different countries across the world. And that's going to provide the basis for some of the um, next slides where I talk to you about the diversity that we see. So this is trying to be as, as representative a sample of the diversity as, as, we can, as we could assemble. How is diversity organized genetically? Well, many of you may know there are two basic varietal groups we call Indica and Japonica. And in this slide, in this unrooted tree, we're showing you the Japonica in blue and the Indica clade uh, um, in red. The colors on that un unrooted tree are the result of chloroplast analysis, so it's genetic analysis, de novo. This was not something we went in knowing. Um, so those colors are based on chloroplast, but the shape of the tree or the topography of the branches of the tree are based on nuclear data. So what you can see is that the chloroplast, which is a much more ancient indicator of ancestry, clearly differentiates those two clades. And it can tell you which clades are ancestrally most closely related to one or the other. When we then look with a higher number uh, of markers or we simply go in and look carefully at the branches of that tree, what we see is that within those two varietal groups, there are three subpopulations within the Japonica group and two within the Indica group. Within the Japonica group, we have tropical Japonica, temperate Japonica, and aromatic or basmati. Within the Indica clade, we have Indica and Aush. And so what I'm showing you, the bottom one is a recent publication from our lab with 700,000 SNPs. The top picture is from 2005, from a study we did with 169 SSR markers. And basically, the population structure remains exactly the same, no matter how many markers you layer on this. So please remember, because these are going to be color-coded for the rest of this talk, we have tropical japonica, which will either be green or bright aqua. The temperate japonicas in darker blue, aromatics in that intermediate 
blue-red, okay, because they, they exist in the, in the middle of that spectrum, but they are ancestrally Japonicas, closely related to Chinese rice. And then the indicas in red and the aushas in, in yellow. And here they are again. This is based on resequencing data where we've actually got now 16 million SNPs. And I just want to show you that basically that structure remains the same. For those of you who do this kind of work, I just want to give you a statistic so you can compare this perhaps with materials that you're familiar with. We have FSTs that are pairwise FSTs on average expressing how much differentiation there is between groups of 0.37. And the most distant groups would be the tempered japonica and the indica, and they're differentiated at about 0.45. That statistic, for those of you who are familiar with it, may, may tell you something. For those of you who are not, I will just say that any two ethnic groups of human or any of the, of the three heterotic groups of maize are differentiated at between 0.01 and 0.08. So rice is a much more ancient, diverged cluster, if you will, of different population groups. And they're much more different than each other than any two human beings are on the face of the planet. They are, in fact, the indica, the Aush, the aromatic, the temperate, and the tropical japonicas, as I've shown you here. And the black lines that you see in this graph are the wild ancestors of each group that you can see flanking the different cultivated groups. Now, what does a subpopulation mean? Well, it means that you have unique variants, unique mutations that have accumulated over evolutionary time. Some of them arose only in one group and therefore they're not shared across groups. And others are just present across groups but at very different frequencies. And that's how those groups are extracted from molecular data. They differ in these groups are found in different ecological and geographical ranges. And so it's likely for a breeder that if you want to, for instance, look for a particular trait, it's much more abundant in one group than another. And again, I think Sigrid touched on that, the Aush subpopulation. And by the way, Aush, sometimes people say to me, is that Australia? And I just want you to know that's a Bengali word because the Aush subpopulation centers around Bangladesh. Um, the Aush subpopulation is particularly rich in abiotic stress resistance genes and traits, and therefore a very rich source of variation for a breeder today. The geographic distribution of these subpopulations, and I'm going to actually let me go back for a minute, uh, remember the color codes and I don't need to repeat them. You see in the center of diversity in Asia a lot of reds and yellows, and outside of Asia in Africa and in North and South America, as well as in Europe, a lot of blue. That means that other than in the center of diversity in Asia, most of the types of rice, they're all arises sativa shown on this graph, but most of them are temperate and tropical japonicas outside of Asia. And that's sort of an interesting thing to keep in mind. There is some red color in, in Latin America, but most of them are tropical japonicas. Whereas in Asia, we see this bright preponderance of all of the subpopulations. And that this, this is geographically organized in, there is a north-south axis, so north of a certain uh, latitude. Uh, we see the, the, temperate, the temperate adapted crops in the dark blues and the magentas. Below that, the tropical adapted crops. We also, interestingly, have an east-west axis for rice variation. On the eastern side, we have a lot of indicas on the, and indicas and tropical japonicas, but not very many aushas. And t on the western part, in South Asia, we see a lot more Aush subpopulation. The Aushas are also distributed throughout Southeast Asia and often found in the more difficult um, or variable ecological zones. So the Aush subpopulation has not been recognized traditionally in either Chinese or Japanese who have done a lot of the early work on rice genetics. They used to claim that there was only indica and japonica, and there's a hot debate raging today in the rice community as to whether Aush is an independently domesticated subpopulation. Genetic evidence would suggest that it, it, that it is. There is also a very strong difference in the amount of diversity within each subpopulation, with indica and Aush having about half of the amount of variation we see in the wild ancestor, and the japonica clade having, again, only half of that which we see in either indica or Aush. And the temperate japonica, which is the far end of this graph, which is where our reference genome is for sequencing, has even less 
variation, and that makes sense because it's the most divergent, it's the most bottlenecked population group. Um, it is a very uniform population and the farthest from the center of variation in the tropics. Any of you who are familiar with what LD decay is, linkage disequilibrium decay, I've also indicated along the bottom, and you'll be interested to see that the LD decay varies by almost an order of magnitude from the Japonica to the Indica to the wild um, ancestral groups. And we can use that to our advantage when we're doing genome-wide association analysis. Now before I tell you something about genome-wide association analysis, I just want to say that one of the things that has always fascinated me and drawn me to the rice community is that not only have ancient rice peoples uh, really shown engineering talent, if you will, because they've sculpted these massive hillsides across the entire range of the Himalayan mountain chain, but the communities that live in these mountains have bred their own rice and much of the rice that they consume, as I have said a moment ago, is locally grown and locally adapted and, in fact, locally bred. So many of the local varieties are maintained only within a community, and some are shared through traditional trading networks, but others are, tr are, are exchanged only, for instance, through marriage or through some form of very traditional um, ancestral relationships. And we took advantage of some of that um, because you can use the isolation of these uh, land races to ask questions about genetics. One of the questions that people like to ask is, many people in Southeast Asia and across South Asia and over into East Asia value aroma as a trait, as a quality trait for rice. And the major gene for aroma had been cloned by Robert Henry's group in Australia, and it's called the bad H2 gene. That bad H2 gene, when knocked out, allows rice to put out aroma, much like if you blocked the exhaust pipe of a car, it would spew exhaust into the air. So what you're actually breathing as this lovely aromatic scent is a cup of something that's not allowed to, to progress in the, rice, uh, the normal rice metabolism. So when you knock out that gene, you get aroma, but there are many different ways to knock out the same gene. And we sequenced this gene, and what you see on this slide is it's got many exons, and each of the little colored lines with a red uh, splice in it shows you where a different mutation was identified in a different exon or in a different intron of that same gene and the corresponding amount of aroma that it gives as based on HPLC. Now, the colors on the subpopulation strand here on this graph show you that each of those mutations was identified in a different genetic background. And when we map those alleles, each mutation in its own genetic background, each one in a different set of lines, to the countries that, where that, was, that material from the gene bank was originally collected, we see that they map all over Southeast Asia, but they do map in clusters. So certain mutations found in, say, tropical Japonica are widely dispersed across Southeast Asia where tropical Japonica is abundant. And then you see that there's, a, there's only one background in Indica, several in Aush. And interestingly, each of these then can be traced to uh, a distribution but only within a very localized area. So it's the same exact phenotype aroma, the same gene, but this molecular evidence tells us that people selected independently for different mutations, different ways to block or knock out that gene, and each of them then can trace ancestry of their own varieties back to their own mutations, which is what this slide is showing you. We then asked, are those mutations equally abundant or equally frequent in rice varieties across uh, the collection that are aromatic? And the answer is no. It turns out that about 60 percent of the time they carry a single mutation, which derives from uh, a basmati origin. And I won't go on about what the patent issues and all that are about this gene, but it's quite interesting that many, many of the uh, supreme quality rices that are aromatic on the market today contain only that single gene, which is a patented uh, gene. But there are many other sources. So if you knew that you could uh, negotiate with a village to access a form of genetic variation that was novel, this is an opportunity both for the village and potentially for somebody who wanted to work with them to develop 
a variety that had its own aroma. The, the consumer might not know the difference. But I mention this example because what's coming up is a lot of discussion tomorrow in the DivSeq initiative about the value of germplasm and ownership of germplasm. And many times, without molecular information, you wouldn't really know the origin of the germplasm you have. So then we, we, we wanted to do genome-wide association analysis, which is to look for the genes underlying traits of interest. And one of the ways in which a community of people can work together to make this process both more enjoyable and much more efficient and more productive is to create a common panel of diversity of purified lines that can be distributed to any researcher anywhere in the world for phenotyping and to put genotypes on that material and those genotypes will then be able to provide the template against which the phenotypes can be associated with genotypes. And since it's fixed material, it's homozygous, it doesn't change, then we have a very powerful system. And we have a rice diversity panel number one, consisting of 400 diverse lines from the different subpopulations, augmented by uh, the rice diversity panel two. Um, first was a collaboration with USDA colleagues in the US, and the second a collaboration with colleagues at Erie, so that collectively the rice community now has a collection of 1,600 homozygous accessions of Rhiza sativa all of which have been genotyped with 700,000 SNPs, and all of that information is available on the internet, can be downloaded, and the seeds can be requested from either Erie or from the USDA. So as a resource, a person who wants to then look at a phenotype of interest to them, peculiar to their particular region of the world or their particular research interest, can do so without repeating all of the painstaking effort that went into creating this resource. And indeed, there is an international phenotyping consortium. It's centered at Erie, and lots of people are looking at these and other resources that have been developed for the community at large across multiple locations, environments, and different forms of collaboration. We have put two little red markers here because I'm going to talk to you. I'm going to give you two examples today. One, um, some grain quality characters, and two, some root phenotypes. And then I'll talk about how we then assemble these into breeding lines in, in improved varieties. So this is just to date me. When I was at Erie back in uh, the 19, early 1990s, we did the very first QTL studies ever done on rice. The first was for blast tolerance, right, blast disease tolerance. The second was for uh, drought tolerance. And I just mention this because I'm going to, I'm going to move into a, a description of some follow-up work that we've done in collaboration with Leon's lab uh, much more recently. So this was published in 1995. You can see there are 12 chromosomes of rice, and those little black dots on the sides of the chromosomes are, represent either RFLP markers in those days, or um, the vertical lines are the QTLs that we identified that associate with a root trait or a drought tolerance score in the field. The root traits were evaluated uh, using a hydroponic system at Erie. Um, we actually had crews of people. We had about 25 uh, technicians working. We had grown the plants. I don't know if you can see in the slide here in the very back. There were long PVC pipes, black pipes, and they had, um, they had plastic liners, and we had people cutting roots and weighing roots and drying roots and looking at roots in different, uh, in different horizons and measuring, you know, the weight of the tillers and counting the tillers, and all of that was being done manually. And we did it with calipers, and we did it with rulers, and we did it with 25 different people. And you can imagine that the data was, it was actually great for its day, but it's nothing like the data that we would expect to get today. So a few years ago, Fast forward, I've still had an interest, a long-term interest in roots and the implications of root systems for drought. And I've collaborated or I've overlapped at least with Sigrid and her beautiful work at Erie on roots and root structures. And many people have been interested in this and I thought, wouldn't this be a great opportunity to, to, to scale up and look at something in a more automated system? So Leon and I had two very uh, talented PhD students, Randy Clark, who came in from biological engineering, and he was trained as a physics student, and Janelle Jung, who was a plant breeding student. And together, Randy developed the phenotyping platform and the software that would extract the trade information and allow us to computationally um, extract both images, 
he extracted. You can see we were growing the little plants in gel and gum. It was completely uh, transparent. The gel and gum, just like many of you use uh, automated systems today, was put in a tube of water and then circulated and 40 images per plant were taken. We took these at different days, days three, six, and nine. And then the root reader software was developed for us to both concatenate those into 3D images and extract a set of 14 different traits from image data. So this was being done on plants that were uh, three days old, six days old, or nine days old, growing in gel and gum. Most people said to me, this is absurd. This will have absolutely no relationship to a plant growing in soil in the field. Whatever it is you think you're doing, go back to Cornell and play with your machines and enjoy your time. You know, you, you, you take these things. So we did that. And Randy and Janelle did uh, a genome-wide association analysis. And here again are the 12 chromosomes of rice. And what you can see is they did two things. They used their genome-wide association mapping panel. That was, about the, that was the panel, the first one, the 400 lines. They also did a biparental QTL analysis using an indica by japonica, an irrigated by an upland uh, rice population. The long black lines show you the resolution of a QTL analysis, still very low resolution scans. And the little red dots show you that for about the same number of plants evaluated, you get a much higher resolution using genome-wide association analysis. So for the same investment on phenotyping, your feedback on GWAS is much greater than it is on biparental QTL. But biparental QTL is considered validation. So anyway, I'm going to tell you very briefly in the next two slides a very fast forward story that I think is very compelling. This is a, a, what we call a Manhattan plot. Along the bottom, you see the 12 chromosomes of rice. There are 700,000 SNPs uh, on this graph. And the x-axis, the y-axis shows you the strength of association. In other words, the p-value, if you will, of the association. The highest most meaningful, most significant cor uh, correlation, or rather association, was found on chromosome 3 at 10 to the minus 7th. And that SNP up at the top is, in fact, that SNP on chromosome 3. So I'm going to go in and show you what we were looking at. So the 13 traits by three days by four subpopulations, I'm going to show you what significant association meant in the gel and gun system. Here is the peak SNP shown uh, in red in the middle. If you move out 33 KB or 66 KB, that's the amount of resolution you get when you have 700,000 SNPs in a GWAS panel. At 66 KB away, which is usually about 10 genes maybe in that interval, you see no difference when you concatenate images of the 39 plants from the indica subpopulation that carry the A allele and the 118 plants from the indica subpopulation that carried the B allele. There is no difference in root length, which is the uh, trait that we're trying to look at here. But when you move 66 KB away, you see there is a difference. Here there were, because of recombination, there were 44 plants from the indica that had the A allele and 107 that had the B allele. The point is that you're within 10 genes of, of something very significant that moderates root length Surely, it's in gel and gum, but it's very significant, and it's highly reproducible. Okay, so that's first thing. It's quite a significant finding. What does it mean in terms of the field? Our groups were not able to do field evaluation, but thanks to Sigrid and several others doing work in Japan, in, in, at Erie, and in many other places around the world, the last 15 years of research had been doing a lot of very backbreaking work, much like the work that I initiated when I went to Erie in 1995. And what they'd shown was that root phenotypes, root angle, root length, in some cases root thickness, was corresponding with very important field traits. And two important genes were cloned just about the time that Leon and I were finding these significant associations with our GWAS panel. One was the pistol gene, which you heard about from Sigrid yesterday, and the other was the draw one gene. Sigrid has already told you about pistol. I'm going to tell you a little bit about draw one. Draw one involves a SNP, 
a single base pair deletion in exon 4 of the draw 1 gene, which changes the root angle and enhances grain yield under drought. You see in these little pictures here the difference in root angle. And that difference is perceptible at three days of age in a rice seedling. And it translates when you move the allele for horizontal deep rooting into the irrigated line IR64, which normally has the shallow rooted allele, you create a near isogenic line. It contains only the allele from the deep rooted parent in the IR64 background. And what you, we call that the IR64 draw one NIL. Under well watered conditions, the near isogenic line shown in red yields the same as the IR64 shown in blue. As you increase drought intensity, the IR64 line shown in blue starts to lose yield. Under moderate drought stress, it's lost half of its yield, while the NIL, the near isogenic line, retains, has no significant difference in yield. And under severe drought stress, where IR64 is dead, the NIL still gives you a little bit of grain. So with one base pair change in exon 4 of this gene, you alter root angle perceptible in a three-day-old seedling, and it matters. So the fact that Leon and my, and my work has identified many dozens of QTLs wouldn't have told us which ones actually matter. But by having the same, having a genomic opportunity to go in and look and see where those alleles fall, we can identify which of the many things that we can identify also at three days of age and we have identified are going to translate into something that's critical in the field. And Sigrid gave you another beautiful example of a root morphology trait associated with phosphorus uptake, which we detect as a root morphological variant and it takes a lot of field work to demonstrate what it means in terms of micronutrient uptake. Okay. So, Draw one, if you're, any of you are interested molecularly, it's, it has to do with gravitropism. Uh, it's abundant in root marrow stems. We can tell you lots about it molecularly now that Dr. Uga's group has cloned it. But I think the most important part of this is the lesson that the work that I started in 1995, or the work that other people are doing today involving field work, can be overlaid on our genomics panels and some of our discoveries that we can do with highly automated systems. It takes both of them to come together in order to interpret what they mean and to know whether for a breeder they have any possibility of application. So then how do you do that? You use marker-assisted selection once you know the gene and you can go ahead and move a trait in a very specific location. After all that work, you can move it into any different genetic background that you want to fairly efficiently. But a breeder is almost never worried about one trait. The physiologists like to work with one trait. The pathologists love to work with their disease traits. But the breeder has to integrate the disease, the physiology, the heat, the cold, the wet, the dry across everything in order to give you a variety that works in your environment. And this is a very important advance that we're going to be talking about in the next few slides, which is the difference between marker-assisted selection and what we call genome-wide or genomic selection. Marker-assisted requires that you focus on a single gene corresponding to a specific trait. It's very powerful. It works very well. And it's very important because many, many varieties have actually been able to be deployed quite quite quickly with new forms of submergence tolerant, drought tolerance, and all these things trait by trait, disease resistance. But what we need to address this question about increasing the rate of genetic gain over the next 30 years to reach the goal of improved productivity for the major and changing environments in which we have to breed uh, rice, we need something that is genome-wide. We cannot go trait by trait. There are 39,000 genes in rice. We don't have time. So, large effect loci are very effectively targeted by marker-assisted selection. And I believe that we, we still need a lot of that work and continued investment in that kind of research. But we're also doing what we call genomic selection to deal with the many unknown small effect QTLs, which if we could assemble them into favorable 
complex arrangements would give us the underlying ability to increase yield 1% per year or 1.6% per, per year and deal with a variety of traits at the same time. So my group has moved over from the marker assisted and we've started to develop these uh, approaches and test them in rice and think about strategies and models. And I want to tell you what this really is because you're all very familiar with it. And when we talk about genomic selection, sometimes people kind of glaze over and I'm not going to put up any equations. So I'm going with a model that many of you know. This is the rise of the Walmart model and then I'm going to show you how it applies to plant breeding. The rise of the Walmart model, the reason why Walmart is so successful, they generate infinite amounts of data on every aspect of our buying choices, our purchasing power and what our choices are. So the point is, you don't go in there with a hypothesis. You just get all the data that you can on your subject matter. Then you use machine learning algorithms to define patterns in your data and to generate hypotheses from the data. In other words, you learn from the data. You don't start with a hypothesis. And then you validate those models and you find your hypotheses as you test your predictions using new unknown populations, which ha is how Walmart learns. It learns from one population to open a new store to figure out and predict based on the demographics what people are going to want to buy. And then they use validated models to predict the behavior and the performance of future populations. And the objective is to beat the competition using data and intelligence to speed up the delivery of products that people want and need. Well, for a plant breeder, the competition are the disease organisms, all of these rapidly evolving pathogens that Sarah spoke about, or the climate change that's going to get ahead of us if we can't beat it. So we, too, have competition to beat. And genomic prediction in plant breeding works much the same way. We collect lots of data on all aspects of the subject matter, which for us is phenotype, environment, genotype, and then we have to figure out how to do this in an automated tracking. We need automated tracking and database systems. We develop models that integrate genotype, phenotype, and environment information, and we predict the performance or the outcomes and the breeding values that we need as breeders to know what to cross and what to select, and even, let me say, how to predict what will happen in the future since we don't have that environment today. And we use genomic, we use GWAS, which is genome-wide association studies, which I've just discussed briefly with you, and genomic selection to do that. And then we train those models and we validate them and we iteratively improve them as we get more data every year. We simultaneously obviously have to be training breeders to incorporate the genomic breeding strategies if we're going to increase the selection accuracy and accelerate product delivery. And that's the role largely of the universities, is to put out students that understand that underlying new paradigm because it's very difficult to send a plant breeding student to train with a plant breeder who's older than 50 years old because they don't use that paradigm. And we have to modify breeding designs to take advantage of these new efficiencies. So what I've been doing is trying to set up collaborative uh, evaluation systems to try to strategically analyze the capacity for the rice community to move in this direction. We have a long-term uh, collaboration with Erie, and we've done some early work with them using 331 advanced indica inbred lines. It was a replicated field trial. I'm going to show you two slides just to show you where we're going with this. Four years of data, two seasons, wet and dry, managed by the Erie breeders and a graduate student on the, on the field in the Philippines. And then we are also working with a national program in Uruguay and we have a very parallel uh, situation set up there with 311 tropical japonica elite lines, replicated yield trials over three years. They only have one season per year instead of two. And we have, uh, we put the SNPs on and we're evaluating many of the same traits. The heritabilities for these traits, I've shown you three traits here. They are yield, plant height, and flowering. The heritabilities are a little lower in the tropics. The variance is a little higher. It's understandable. It's a, it's a more difficult system to work in. There are more disease pressure, et cetera. So we have slightly higher heritabilities in the subtropical zones in Uruguay than we do at Erie. But you can see that they're, uh, they're similar in that flowering time, um, flowering time plant height and yield are, are the same traits being evaluated. Now this is uh, 
the evaluation coming out of our predictions using the first models that we've ever constructed. And I'm showing you that the optimal model for yield, using our, our blub model for those of you who are familiar with that, and our prediction accuracies, this is eerie data, are about 0.3, very similar to the heritabilities for the trait, for plant height, 0.34, and for flowering, 0.62. So in line with the eerie trait heritabilities, our predictions are about as good as the heritability. What does that mean? That means that using genomic information alone, genomic information on a breeder's population, we can predict with roughly the same accuracy what the outcome, what the best lines will be compared to doing an entire year of field trials. So if you can, if you can follow me, our prediction accuracies, accuracies so far are not better, but they are as good, which means that you could imagine if you're a Uruguayan breeder and you don't have an off-season, you don't have two seasons a year, you could advance populations, gain a season using only genomic predictions and not be any worse off than waiting an entire another year until you had another breeding, uh, another breeding cycle. And then I want to take it one next step. We've, we've just published a second paper showing that we can improve our genomic selection prediction accuracies, uh, which we estimate using five-fold cross-validation, and this is for those of you who are using models. It's just based on validation accuracies. And flowering time, when you run genome-wide association on the breeder's material, where you have both genotype and phenotype information, you can run a model and make predictions, or you can run a genome-wide association model and dissect and find out which SNPs are significantly associated with the traits of interest. We take the same material and we take the same genotype and phenotype information and run two different models. I'm showing you here that for flowering time, we have a single QTL that explains 45% of the, of the phenotypic variation. PVE is phenotypic variation explained. So one major QTL segregating the breeding material at Erie. For yield, there's one QTL, but it only explains 10% of the phenotypic variation. That's a small effect, QTL. And for plant height, we have four QTLs, which collectively explain 75 or 74% of the phenotypic variation. The rest of the phenotypic variation is explained by a multitude of small effect alleles for which we have no idea what they do, nor do we try to uh, estimate where they are in the genome. And these are the, uh, these are the prediction accuracies based on dry season and wet season. But the take-home here is not about what those accuracies are, which are roughly what the heritabilities are, but rather the fact that when we introduce SNP, SNPs that are strongly correlated using the GWAS model, in other words, the most significant SNP for the QTL associated with flowering time yield and the four QTLs associated with plant height, when we introduce those SNPs as covariates in our genomic prediction model, we increase the accuracy significantly. And it's more significant when there are a few QTLs of big effect, because what we're effectively doing is weighting SNPs that are actually explaining a larger portion of the variation. So for flowering time, we increase uh, our accuracies by 35 percent. For yield, where the QTL is a very small effect, we only increase it by 14 percent, but it is an increase in prediction accuracy. And for plant height, we increase it by 20 percent. So unbelievable to the, the, the plant breeder today is the fact that right there, if you can afford to genotype your data, you're phenotyping it anyway. You can build two models. You can build a model that tells you where the most significant alleles are that are associated with traits of interest that you're measuring anyway. And you can simultaneously build a prediction model. And if you put the two together, you have predictions that are now better than what you get by doing an entire another field season to extract more information about your material. And our models are iterative, so every year we can improve them as we get more data on the same populations. The other take home from this, and I'm at the end of the talk here, is that if you combine your genome-wide association studies with your genomic prediction models, we have a way to help integrate valuable diversity coming from the gene bank. These are underutilized accessions where we can actually identify novel variation that we want to bring in. And at the same time, if you combine it with your genomic selection, you can then improve the myriad of small effect genes to get you back to the elite parents in the elite breeding pools that you want to work with. 
to sustainably accelerate the rate of genetic gain. And if you want to read that paper, it's just come out in Heredity earlier this year. So I'll end by saying that I think if we look at what not just big data and bioinformatics, but appropriate modeling, really good phenotyping, community coordination, and sharing through databases and resources, we can link genome-wide association and genomic prediction to better utilize natural variation. The genome-wide associations help us develop the genotype-phenotype relationships, and they can help us find specific traits and genes that we want to use and integress and bring along in our breeding material. But the genetic architecture of most complex traits, which are most of what breeders deal with, involves a combination of alleles of large effect and the myriad small effect alleles, where we have to actually manage different genes and alleles in different populations. And we now have ways to use genomic assisted breeding to manage that and make it more efficient. So if we use a, com a combination of genome-wide association and genomic selection, we can target favorable alleles of large effect and enhance the accuracy of genome-wide prediction for genetic gain, and hopefully that will get us to our 30 percent or our 50 percent improvement in the next 30 years. Thank you very much, and I want to acknowledge a slew of people, so thank you. This, sorry, I probably wasn't clear. These are breeding materials. They're the actual breeding materials from the breeders' programs. They're using multiple parents. These are not biparental crosses. We're using the collection of advanced lines that they have in the field at any one time, and they could be collections from uh, any range of variation, yeah. So the, we're not working with biparentals here. Um, I'm wondering if you've, you know, when you looked at all your SNPs, whether you, um, you've considered looking, uh, apologies if you've already done this, it's in the paper, I can't remember, but have you um, like sort of split things up into coding, um, so non-coding sequences versus coding sequences? And the reason I'm asking is that when you're doing, you know, so you'd mentioned, you know, when you cross things that are too close together, they don't do anything. When they're too far apart, they're sterile. So gene regulation and transcription factors and things come to mind, and therefore I'm wondering if you've gotten to that level of analysis, you know, where you can actually you know, infer those kinds of things. With your, uh, with your genome-wide association, you do go there. With your genomic prediction, you don't. It's all based on LD. Okay. It's basically LD mapping. Um, and there'd be no point, because it doesn't matter. Um, but it's true if you knew the functional SNP, and of course, based on the early example I gave you about aroma, there may be 10, 20 different functional SNPs in the same gene. Right. So that would be a more than a career's worth of endeavor. Yeah, if you do know, however, the functional nucleotide polymorphism in your genes, you can put those in as fixed variables in your model. And it is helpful, and it does improve your model. I guess my question was more towards the assessment of biodiversity, so more towards the beginning of your talk when you were showing those trees and things oh, like I'm that. Sorry. So okay. I see. Oh, I'm sorry. So it was more of that, sorry. It was like, I what's see. the nature of that divergence, right? And so yeah. in, is, it, is, it in, is it in regulatory regions or, and so it was, it, it's more of a general question. So. Yeah, so that's a really interesting question. I'm sorry, I, I, I misinterpreted. That's okay. Um, the real answer to that question is that there was a collaboration between Erie and BGI to mm -hmm. resequence 3,000 genomes. And there you can go in and actually look at across all 3,000, but the problem is there's no phenotypes for those 3,000. So it, you, you can order them and then you can phenotype. Right. And so collectively, you know, our group did a 125 and somebody else has done, you know, 150 and uh -huh. Erie did 3,000 and somebody else is doing 10,000. So infinite numbers, sequences with information about functional and putative Mm -hmm. coding and non-coding. We also built a chip, the 700,000 SNP chip, that has a non-synonymous SNP in every gene in the genome on that chip, but it might not be the functional, right? right? Yeah, yeah. So I think you're, in, you're, you're really asking an important question, and that at this point is still a level 
beyond what the breeder is doing, but it's more what the researcher and the molecular biologists mm -hmm. are interested in. Yeah. Thank you. And rice is a great organism to work in for that. Can I ask just one small final question, just kind of an extension of that? So you, you've mapped out all these SNPs and you've shown a lot of variation. Um, how much things like you know, structural variation, like copy number variation, like we know in humans, for example, you know, CNVs or, you know, yeah. leases a lot of diversity. So yeah. are, are, you con are, are those things being looked at? Are those things that are? So what's curious about that is all of the resequencing is aligned to a single reference genome, and I mentioned right. it's a temperate. Yeah. So I think Sigrid's work really showed this very clearly. In her case, I think it was a 91 KB fragment was missing from the uh -huh. reference. So there's absolutely nothing except really good molecular biology right. to go in and dig those out. Yeah. But on the other hand, I think that the diversity information that I believe every gene bank wants and dreams of, and every user of a gene bank dreams of having access to, would be simply that catalog of diversity so that you can go in and do more to find out which, right. which accessions are what you want. Got it. Thank you. Actually, most of my questions have been answered already with referring to the 3000 um, genome. And maybe if you want to elaborate a little more what's the, the future of that is. I mean, are there concerted efforts or plans to, to do a phenotyping um, and align this with the uh, data? On, on those 3000? I mean, I think the future is to do phenotyping on selected ones that you might select phylogenetically or you might select based on um, candidate alleles of interest. And I think the other thing is that people are really starting to want to make crosses between certain members of those that have been sequenced so that they can look at how segregation works to reassemble those alleles. There's, uh, there are lifetimes of, of opportunity ahead, but I think that having the genome sequence is a really good starting place for all the other layers of both omics and phenotyping information you want to put in. Yeah. Sorry, yeah, we're running over. I know everybody's looking forward to okay. their beer Thanks, glass of wine. Neil. This is just a quick one. I think uh, both uh, with um, with QTLs and genomic selection, you've met, you've definitely made the case for the precision that is now possible. Uh, what about as we are talking about a time limited thing as well? We, we've we've got a kind of 2050 window here. Yeah. Uh, how much time does it save us, and what are the ways in which computationally you can actually develop breeding strategies that will be also faster um, through genomic selection? So I, I think that some of genomic selection is just speeding up your ability to find recombinants that are valuable. And in the cattle industry, it's absolutely the way to go because you have a different generation time. For us, I think the cost-benefit analysis means that you have to figure out how to integrate it into your current breeding program, and you may not have the money to genotype every generation. In that case, probably our idea is that at some point for the big effect alleles, you'll probably use CRISPR-Cas9 to use a template of what the wild should be, the wild type allele, and to put that into a current breeding operation so that that happens more quickly. I don't see that happening at every you know, gene in the genome, and we don't know what we're selecting on with genomic prediction, but my estimate is if you start introducing genomic prediction now and the modern breeder uses it as a matter of course but uses the large effect, continues to build on research, on basic research, which starts to tell us really important things about, for instance, upstream master switches or downstream regulators, I think that that combination with CRISPR-Cas9 is going to be right now the only way to go. We're, in, we're sort of canoeing in fast water, and we want to move with, with the, the current, um, but I don't see any miraculous silver bullet that's just going to give us, um, you know, magical varieties tomorrow. I think it's going to be 1.1 1 .1 to 2 percent every year, and we need pipelines, and we need lots of new materials coming out, and we need, by the way, I just want to end by this. We need to diversify the entire landscape of varieties. And it's taken previously so long and so much effort to produce a single variety 
you know, it's taken so long. This approach has the potential to spew out new varieties so that there's more diversity in the field, incrementally improving, but also not betting on one mega variety that's going to go out over 100 million hectares. I think those days are gone, but we need this kind of thing to keep, put, keep the pipeline full. And it also, means that, it also means that because of that work, we have candidates to send now to SIGRID or to people at Erie to test because we don't know what the impact of the field will be. And we want people to look at micronutrient uptake and problem soils and all of these things that, you know, a smaller number of lines now could be tested and could be done quite efficiently. So I think it, it speaks to international collaboration, it speaks to open data, it speaks to data standards so that we can compare and contrast, and it really speaks to trying to map out the priorities that are, that are going to be needed so that we coordinate our efforts. And I do think that there is potential, but it requires sociology and institutional framework bending as well. Well, I'm sure after a long three days of uh, really heady discussion, we're all ready to uh, let our hair down a little bit. I've got an awful lot to let down, but even so. Um, and so thank you all. This could not have happened without the quality of the speakers that we have. It's a great audience, but the speakers uh, have been uniformly uh, magnificent. And thank you very much, uh, especially the ones that have come so far to speak uh, and uh, bring your words of wisdom to this conference. Thanks, everybody, and we'll see you at the Western Development Museum. Thank you. Thank you.